Hi, it's teardown time. We've got the new Rigol DHO814, DHO800 series, 389 Yankee Bucks for the four channel. We'll forget that the two channel actually uh, exists. And this is the new one just released, which is the low cost version of both the HDO, which is now called the DHO. Uh. I don't know, whatever. The DHO 1000 series and the 4000 series, which came out at almost the same time, and I've done teardowns on both of those. So basically, the 4000 is the high-end, high-performance, high-bandwidth uh, cost unit in the new uh, center architecture, I think it is. And the 1000 series over here, this is just a lower-cost version. As we saw in the teardown, it's basically the same, except it's uh, lacking an extra analog guard to digital converter. So if you've got all four... Uh, channels on it you know drops it by a uh, quarter of the uh, two gig sample per second that uh, sample rate but it's basically a cheaper but th basically the hardware is uh, pretty much the same apart from the lack of uh, the smart uh, probe uh, interface over here which you get on the 4000 but anyway um, that starts at 999 Yankee bucks for the uh, four channel version but this cute little thing look at it look at it Look at it. It's gorgeous. It's got the visa mount. It's got USB-C power. It's got HDMI output. I've just been experimenting with that today. And it seems to render at a higher resolution than the built-in 7-inch uh, touchscreen, which is 1024 by 600. So it seems to output at the native resolution of your monitor. But I don't think at this stage you actually get increased bits but it does look really good LAN and USB they're all standard it's got a fan in it which is kind of a little bit whiny high pitched as you'd expect anyway we're going to take a look at that it's got the visa mount of course absolutely fantastic you have to mount on uh, standoffs to get some airflow <laughs> cooling in there perhaps and it's got this integral handle I guess um, you know if you're going to mount it on a visa mount you probably don't want a handle flapped around in the breeze anyway this is cute Starts at 389 bucks for the four channel. We're going to forget the two channel uh, exists. So let's do a tear down in 4K resolution. Thank you very much. High res photos or as always available on evlog.com. And I have done a uh, unboxing and first impressions video of this. That's exclusively available over on my evlog.com website. So check that out if you want to watch that video. I've also done a size comparison video on my evlog2 channel. But anyway, let's go. It looks like we've got... Uh, four screws here two up there and bob's your uncle the back should just lift off now because this is usb-c powered it does come with a uh, light on fully uh, certified power brick i'm not going to take that apart because that looks like it's ultrasonically welded but it's got full certifications it's uh, light on they're at least a uh, reputable name and because it's usb-c powered it is uh, technically isolated i did actually measure one meg uh, from the earth to the shield here so it's not directly uh, connected it's got a bleeder in there and that's why they provide you with this handy dandy little low impedance earth lead which goes onto the chassis in there so anyway let's crack it open so we're talking a reduction from 999 us dollars uh for the 1000 series to 389 for this one both four channels so I expect that they've got uh, some significant price reductions. I don't know if this will have the same RTX 7 uh, processor that we saw in the 1000 and the uh, 4000, and whether or not it has the same 800 megahertz bandwidth uh, front end. So we'll we'll find out. Oh, 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 I almost forgot to void the warranty. Hang on. You can bet your ass I want to void that warranty. Oh, there we go. Oh, that's satisfying. All right, there's no nut on there, so this should just lift off. Come on, you can do it. That was caught there, was it? Don't know. Anyway, ah, we're in. Check it out. Yeah, there's nothing else on the uh, bottom there. We do have our metal threaded inserts for the plastic here, but this thing only weighs 1.3 kilos, so you don't really need an extra like metal base plate in there or anything like that. So they they should be adequate for the uh, visa mount. Yeah, it's not heavy at all. So yeah, look, um, there's not much complexity in that uh, mold there. That's for sure. Oh, right off the bat, look at this. It's called the Small Sparrow. Oh, how cute. Right, because didn't the one have it? Oh, I forget which specific bird they had silk screened onto the existing one, but it's the Small Sparrow. There you go. 230525 version 1.01 .01 for those playing along at home. 
do have some unpopulated memory. Now, you've got to remember, this thing is also available as the DHO 900 series. And the difference is, is that the 900 series is higher bandwidth. This one only goes to 100 megahertz. The 900 series goes to 100 and, uh, 250 megahertz, I believe it is. And it has a logic analyzer option, which is really interesting because neither the 1000 nor the 4000 have a logic analyzer option. And a lot of people complained about that, but the little ultra baby DHO 900 does. Anyway, um, yeah, lots of uh, uh, power supply action happening over here. We've got, is that an SD card? That's an SD card glued into there. Wow, look at that. <laughs> They've, yeah, is that? They've actually glued in that SD card. That's interesting. I might have to get that out and have a read. Um, can we just update? Because this does run the Android operating system. Is it? Is the operating system just on the SD card? Is that is that a thing? I, I don't know. Is that a way to reduce cost? I don't know. Anyway, we have some headers here. And check it out. That is your logic analyzer option. The, the footprint is there. It's unpopulated. There's a couple of more chips unpopulated down there, so I'm not sure what's doing there. Anyway, um, they've got another connector over here which is unpopulated. That could be a production test. Oh, uh, there's an extra BNC over here. That's interesting, which goes up to another un unpopulated chip up here. So uh, does the DHO900 have an additional uh, external trigger? No, like a, a reference out or something? I don't know, but this one's got an aux out. You know, I'll have a look at that whiny little uh, fan in a minute. As I said, it's not, like, it's loud, but it's not annoyingly loud. Um, it's not too horrific. Anyway, oh, there we go. We're in. There's our front end there. One of the uh, sill pads came off there. And, oh, yeah, there's our little small sparrow. Oh, isn't it cute? Small sparrow. Look. <laughs> so I guess, yeah, it's a sparrow. I, unless anyone wants to uh, contend that that's not a sparrow. Oh, we've got ourselves the rock chip here. But I like that they've got just one gigantic heat sink uh, to cover everything. Aha, uh -huh, that looks different. That's not our RTX 7, so we'll take a good look at that. That's how they got the cost down. So maybe, uh, you know, performance update rate and stuff like that of this one um, is not going to be as grunty as the 1000 or 4000 series. But that's where I expected them to cut cost on the FPGA there, because that was the RTX 7 was a really expensive FPGA. So they've obviously uh, cut uh, some corners there. There is some RAM missing, as I said. Got the one ADC here, which covers everything. We'll see if it's the same jobby, and we'll see if the uh, Rigol um, custom chip is the same on the front end, but they've only got the one relay there, so it does look uh, quite different. But it's crazy that, like, that whole thing is a 100 megahertz front end. Anyway, uh, so on the back of the heatsink here, we're just got the large uh, sill pads going on to the die cast block. Very nice. The four uh, front ends. That's the analog uh, to digital converter. And then our uh, main FPGA here and then our uh, rock chip uh, processor running the Android OS over here. Now, there's one thing many people wanted to see, of course, and that's the USB-C uh, interface. Yes, it is soldered directly down on the board. It's not on its own little daughter board. So, you know, if you wiggle, 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 yeah, that um, it could break off. So that's one of the weak points of uh, the design of this thing but you know for the cost reduction yeah i guess it's acceptable but yeah if you start ripping uh, your pads off your usb-c interface there you, you know you you're going to be in a bit of a spot of bother anyway so yeah there's no alternative way to power this and they should have supplied a right angle usb-c so it could come out here like this because this thing can actually sit very nicely flat it's purposely designed to sit like nicely flat like that. So yeah, please supply a right angle uh, USB-C, come on. And maybe some sort of like uh, cable clamping solution built into the uh, back molding. That would have been nice too. You know, you could put it in and you could like cable tie it in or something. So it takes the strain off the USB-C connector, especially if you're moving this thing around on like a visa mount arm or something like that. You don't want the cable just to get snagged or whatever and oops. So I've taken all the screws off there and it doesn't seem to, like, want to pop out. Okay, so that's the front panel power button. That seems to go to the main board. Is everything connected to the main board? Because the other side doesn't want to come out. So I'm thinking maybe I have to undo the chassis first. And, yeah, I don't know. Is it screwed from the other side as well? All right, so I've gotten all of the screws out, including the chassis ones. And there you go. Chassis is starting to come out. The button is 
certainly on the front, although I don't think the... Um, I think there's a separate board in there, is there, for the... Oh, no, th there we go, got it, got it. So, yeah, there we go. There's board-to-board -board interconnect there for your uh, display interface. So that's uh, obviously display interface uh, capacitive uh, touch there. I'll take, I won't bother taking you through those photos available on evblog.com. But there you go. That's a nice solution. Duh, obviously. Yet yeah, we had to get that out first to get the nuts off and then the PCB will lift out. No worries. But anyway, look, we do have the chassis cut out. Of course you're going to reuse uh, the chassis between the 800 and the 900 series. So it's all populated. So whether or not, um, as I said in the previous video, uh, available on evblog.com, um, you, somebody on the forum has apparently hacked this 800 series to a 900 series. But I don't know if it enables the logic analyzer. Apparently this just goes off. We'll see if there's any missing chips. But apparently I think it might just go off uh, to the, um, uh, I think, which is a Xilinx uh, Z think FPGA. Anyway, um, power buttons on the main board. And just some attention to detail with the RFI uh, conductive sponge going between the chassis and the uh, metal backing of the LCD as well. Nice. And there's the metal work for you metal work aficionados. Um, metal threaded insert uh, studs in there. So that's very nice. Look at that. But basically, yeah, there's that piece. And then there's the two, then there's the PCB. And then there's the two other pieces. And Bob's your uncle. Oh, and their heatsink, of course. And and Bob's your uncle. Jeez, they've really gotten this uh, uh, production stuff down pat, haven't they? The plastic injection moulding experts will have to weigh in on this, but to me, this seems like relatively um, simple plastic moulding. I mean, you've got two major plastic moulded pieces, and that's it for this entire design, plus the one little formed uh, metal there for that. And... Like Bob's your uncle, so you can really see how they're uh, cutting the production cost on this. It's it's really nice. There's no you know, minimal of extra stuff required. They've even integrated the uh, the little mounting clips there on that uh, on that one piece mold. But yeah, two plastic molds for this whole thing. But this mold must be different between the 800 and the 900 because there is no cutout in there. And we'll take a look at the PCB in a minute. I think that's really curious. Hmm. And there's the back side there, and there's not much. Um, the front end just has a few uh, passives there and an extra chip. That could be a 595 or something. And is that for the... Uh, that location seems to be for the uh, auxiliary output uh, here. But, um, yeah, all the USB uh, stuff and HDMI and all that, that's all on the top side there. And that looks like it's all handled by the rock chip. I do believe it's all internal to the rock chip. I think that is the same one from memory. But yeah, I see something really interesting down here. Anyway, uh, let's go over to the videotape and we'll have a closer look. All right, let's compare with the HDO 1000. And as I've shown in the previous video, the HDO 1000 is basically identical to the HDO 4000. So here's our new board. And obviously the big change here is the zinc. Uh, processor, as you find in practically every modern scope, has <laughs> the Xilinx Zinc in there. Um, and this one has the RTX 7, of course. So, a, once a, I have not used this in anger yet, so I don't know about like the, uh, you know, the grunt speed, the pro waveform update rate, and all the rest of it, okay? But that's all being run inside the RTX 7. The new architecture is all uh, done inside there. And then the HDO 1000 had a single analog uh, to digital converter as opposed to uh, dual ones on the HDO 4000. And the new HDO 800, it's upside down, all the electrons are going to fall out. RT8847-1. Uh, see, that looks like 88471. I've got high, higher res photos. Uh, always available on my Flickr account, by the way, which is uh, on my EV, also linked in on evblog.com. So it's exactly the same analog to digital converter as used in the other ones, but you only get the one. So you turn on all four channels and they all feed in. And you can actually see here the trace of uh, the uh, differential pair output here, uh, trace length matched here so that they're all equal timing going into the analog uh, to digital uh, converter there. So this one is 1.25 gig sample per second. So you can divide that by four if you turn on all four channels there. And once again, because there's only one, it makes no difference. You can't do that trick of like using channel one and using channel three as you can on some other uh, scopes that have uh, two analog to digital converters. This is one sharing all four channels and that's how they reduce the cost there and 
there. Um, that's the main. And the uh, Rock Chip uh, RK3399, is it? I believe that is the same. Yeah, there it is, Rock Chip 3399. It's just rotated um, <laughs> for layout uh, reasons, but exactly the same uh, processor that's running the Android operating system. But we did not find an SD card anywhere on the uh, HDO 1000 or the 4000, or DHO, whatever we named it. So yeah, I'm gonna uh, look at the contents of that card in a minute. So we've got some memory missing here. There's nothing on the uh, bottom side. I'd say that could be, uh, not only does the uh, the 900 model have more me sample memory, don't quite, I think it does, um, but also doesn't have the uh, logic analyzer. So I figure if you're gonna put the, lo if you're gonna try and hack this to include the logic analyzer, um, you might have, find you have to install those chips. Now, interestingly, look, they've populated the termination resistors here. Why would you, do, you know, if you're reducing your bill of, I know they don't cost anything, but you know, it's all production time. It's all, you know, like you've got to change your production reels faster and stuff like that. Uh, the more, like they're just absolutely wasted, right? But they populate them. But you can see if we look at the bottom side of the board, they've also done down here for the logic analyzer. Here's the logic analyzer, which is not an option on the 800. It doesn't physically have the cutout on the front, but the footprint said layout's the same. They've included the series resistors here. They've populated those, right? They don't, those don't come for free. Why would you not just simply remove those from your bill of materials? I don't get it. So it's almost as if, like, conspiracy theory, they want you to hack this thing, and but you'd have to dremel out the front, cut like a hole in the front case, but yeah, no worries. Um, you can see that, uh, yeah, there's no um, extra memory, like on the bottom side here, here's that memory. Look, 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 <laughs> they've populated, <laughs> they've populated all of the bypass caps, count them, count them. Right, I know they, you know, sense each or point something sense each. Right, did they? They all add up. Look for the unpopulated chips, those extra memory chips. So all we have to do is get a photo of the um, nine thousand. Someone will do a teardown. We'll be able to find out what chips they are. Presumably, you can buy them, and you could look. You know, they're BGA. You know, you got to be careful, but you might be able to like reflow those on there, and maybe everything's good to go for your uh, to convert this into a, a logic analyzer. Now these ones down here, once again, all this stuff is populated down here and these two chips are not, but they don't, they seem like power supply related. So I'm not sure what's going on there. So that's interesting. It'll be interesting once we get a uh, photo of the uh, DHO9 uh, hundred. But yeah, all the memories installed for the processor, so that's not a uh, problem. Anyway, I know you all want to see the front end. Uh, sorry, stupid drawboard PDF is the software I'm using here. It doesn't let me scroll in the vertical direction like that. Um, yeah, right, here's the, here's the, I think this is the 4000, this is the 1000, and this is the 800. But it's basically missing the extra uh, relay here because it doesn't have 50 ohm uh, termination. So they've saved some cost there, but look, the chipset's the same. It's the RT1642IQ. It's exactly the same chipset. In fact, there's only a couple of weeks difference in the manufacture there. Look at that. Um, so yeah, this is Rigol's a custom front end chip. And it looks, you know, the layout's a bit different with the parts around here, but that's neither here nor there. This chip is capable of 800 megahertz. So in theory, um, this front end is capable of 800 megahertz. So there's absolutely no doubt in my mind, unless it's like software limited, software bandwidth limited, of course, uh, internally it's got the bandwidth, uh, software bandwidth limit uh, filters built in. They just send a uh, serial command to it and it's the, uh, you know, it's got a programmable gain amplifier in here and uh, they, and uh, programmable filters as well. So they can actually, um, you can set that. I don't think you would have to hardware hack any filter, uh, you know, any external components. I think you just, you know, you upgrade it to the DHO 900, and I think I think you're going to get that 250 meg bandwidth. But I think it's capable of more. Um, you know, unless there's like layout and other tweaking reasons, I'm I'm not seeing it. It's the same relay. It's the same Cosmo relay down here that shorts out the AC coupling um, and stuff. So, uh, yeah. I think it's capable of 800 meg. <laughs> it's just a software limitation. But it makes sense. Once you've spent all the NRE, the non-recurring engineering costs, uh, designing the custom ASIC for this, you, you just use it in absolutely 
everything. You use it in your 300 and, well, it's minimum $329 retail uh, scope for the two channel, right up to your multi thousand dollar, you know, a 4000 uh, series. Just the same chip and it's capable of 800 meg. No worries. And on the bottom of the front end here, yeah, we've just got a uh, 4053 MUX there, but yeah, there's basically nothing doing there at all. There's no extra. But yeah, that, that logic analyzer there, it just goes straight into the Zinc FPGA. Just got a series resistor here and Bob's your uncle, right? So there's no extra like level um, stuff. It's just going straight in. But the FPGA, they might have a selectable, you know, a threshold front end, you know, 3.3, 1.8, something like that. So I don't know what the uh, DHO 900 is capable of in, in that regard, but it's just, yeah, basically digital straight in. No worries. I mean, there's not even any protection, is there? Yeah, nah, it's just, there's just nothing on the top here. So there you go. You can get some of the pinouts there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, people are making their own do-it-yourself uh, probes for the uh, Rigol um, scopes, of course, and they seem to work just fine. So we've got our small sparrow there, but like there's not much else to really show you on here apart from uh, this jumper link here. This is uh, Flash and JTAG. Um, I might actually solder in another uh, like a header in there because that's a transmit and receive. So I might put that on the serial packet uh, sniffer. But um, over here, right up the top here, uh, they've once again got ground, transmit and receive. I don't know if that's a duplicate one or a different one. Um, and that one, I can't see it. That might be a JTAG. And the only other interesting thing up here is the arbitrary waveform generator, which is optional on the DHO 900 and it's going it looks like it, there's a just a uh, this would just be a buffer chip this is just be a buffer driver I mean looks like this will be the input here this pin and this is the output so uh, that's very common you just have a 50 ohm uh, buffer driver there but where's the other circuitry for the ARB I mean this is it over here but like there's no DAC or anything so is that where's it Where's it coming from? Is they're just an MPM 36R30 uh, step down uh, converter, and they've uh, in interestingly they've got an integrated inductor. If you're wondering where's the magnetics, um, yeah, they're they're actually integrated in there. So they're just some step down converters. So so there's nothing else really doing on this board. Um, the soft uh, power over here, that's probably uh, part of that there. Um, the, I noticed that when I put it through a uh, power meter and only limited to five volts. The lead would still light up and it would turn green, but then uh, five volts was not enough to power this thing. It needed to negotiate over USB-C for the uh, 15 uh, volts, and but it still the lead still came on and operated um, on and off at uh, when I limited it to uh, five volts. So that was interesting. Yeah, but that's all she wrote there on the new HDO. Um, 800. They've really got that price down with the Zinc processor, the 180C. They're just reusing the front end, eliminating the 50 ohms, uh, you know, having optimized assembly uh, procedures and stuff like that. But having the extra components on there for the <laughs> all the bypass caps and everything for those chips, that's just, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I just, no, no, I couldn't, I couldn't allow that. I could not allow that. As an engineer, I could not allow that in production to put all this termination stuff on here and, and just not have the chips populated. Oh, God, no, the humanity. Anyway, um, that's a look at the board there. There's not much else uh, to tell you. So I'll go have a sniff of these things and uh, see what we get and the SD card. All right, we have a serial terminal uh, connected up here. So I'm getting uh, transmit, receive, ground, and uh, power because I'm just using one of these uh, isolated uh, micro art. Um, came in the mailbag a while back. Um, it's one of several that I've got. Uh, usually 115,000 board. So 8N1 standard. It's even 9600 or you know 115K. Sometimes it's like 19.6 or something weird like that. But let's switch it on. Whoop! Whoa! Why'd it vanish? There you are! There you are! <laughs> I don't know why that vanished. We're in! So I'll dump this on the EEV blog uh, forum. So it's, yeah, it's the rock chip, uh, setting up ports, HDMI, I squared C bus driver. Like I said, I think it actually detects the monitor you've got connected and selects the appropriate and scales the appropriate output resolution. Now, whether or not the 12-bit data is actually mapped into the screen, haven't confirmed that yet, maybe not. But it seems to scale 
the interface, which makes sense because this is only a 1024 by 600 display, then it's got to map it to bigger displays, and the this same firmware would be used on the other higher end scopes which have higher resolution screens. So it makes sense that they would build the firmware to scale. At least the user interface, because the user interface looks great. I've got it, I've had it on a 4K external monitor. Looks, looks really schmick. It doesn't look like 1024 by 600. So can we get in? Haha, <laughs> Rigol prompt. Help games. Nope. <laughs> Joshua. Damn. Anyway, I got no idea what I'm doing here. So that's one up in this corner. There's also this one over here. I did solder a header in there. All right, so I've got that hooked up. Unfortunately, VCC is over here, so I have to bring that wire over. If you've got a non-isolated one, you don't need the uh, VCC, of course. There we go. Hey, Xilinx, first stage bootloader. Silicon version 3.1, boot mode is QSPI. Okay, so that's, well, that's the flash. Xilinx, first stage bootloader. Release 2020, boom, boom. Once again, this is all stuff that I will dump. I will dump this as well over on the EV blog forum. And back to the boot code here, we do actually get an accurate uh, boot time, 47.4 seconds. Now, I was able to get this SD card out uh, from the glue. It's a 32 gig Lexa uh, jobby. I was not able to read it, even with like a Linux reader program or whatever, but it just doesn't identify under Win Windows or a Linux uh, reader. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it doesn't actually contain anything. Maybe it's designed to use as just cheap ass memory or something. Perhaps that's non-critical, but I, I, I don't know. Anyway, I'm going to try and boot it um, without having that. And uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to uh, stick something in the front because I forgot to put the button back in <laughs> before I screwed the board down. Oh, well, sure enough, there's... No Rigol boot message without the card. So um, it booted fine before with the card. So yeah, I, I, I'm presuming it contains the OS, I guess, or some needed stuff required for the boot uh, process. So yeah, it's on there. Um, I don't know. I'm going to have to uh, uh, get the nerds on the forum to try and uh, help me with that one because I can't read the card. Maybe I'll try a Linux machine. And the card's gone back in, and it boots up straight away to the splash screen. Yeah, the boot is slow. It's about 45, 46 seconds, something like that. Mm -hmm. So there you have it. That's the new DHO 800, and I'll show you the power consumption there. So it negotiates uh, the 15 volts output, 2.4 amps, so uh, just over 35 watts there. Um, that's with, like, it doesn't matter if you have all four channels and uh, the math on, it's basically uh, the same uh, power consumption. So 35-odd watts there if you want to power it from a battery pack, which you could, of course, you could uh, design your own custom mount, put it on, a v on the Visa mount on the back and have the cable running over it. And you could actually power this uh, from battery, but offhand, I haven't seen that star arrangement for that fan before, but you might want to replace the fan with a more silent solution, but I don't know if you're going to get much better because, yeah, it's right near all these and I don't know what you can do there. So anyway, it sucks air in uh, from the back uh, through the visa mount and then comes out through all the fins out here like this and then out the vents out the side. So it's a little bit noticeable if it's a quiet, if the labs are completely quiet, I can hear it from halfway across the lab, uh, for example. So it's a little bit whiny. It's certainly not the worst arm I've heard, those. Anyway, this is a hugely interesting develop in the oscilloscope scene. I mean, a 12-bit four-channel scope for uh, 389 Yankee bucks. As I said, forget about the uh, two channel with the possibility of hacking uh, this thing. Unfortunately, like if you go to too high a bandwidth, it doesn't have the sample rate in there with that one ADC and the 1.25 gig sample uh, per second. Once you turn on the four channels, Eh, you know, you might be able to bandwidth hack it and then get uh, extra bandwidth on, say, one channel, uh, for example. But you, you turn on more and that sample rate's just not quite going to cut the mustard. I'm looking forward to doing a full review of this thing and uh, playing around with this a lot more because, well, this might have uh, changed the oscilloscope, the entry level oscilloscope uh, landscape. So hats off to Rygo. I think they've done something uh, really special and it's going to drive the industry here. I mean... 
it, you know, 8-bit might be dead. I don't know, uh, at least at this entry level uh, price point anyway. But anyway, thoughts and comments down below. And if you like that video, please give it a big thumbs up. And as always, uh, discuss down below EV Blog Forum, high-risk pictures over on evblog.com. As uh, also, there's I've already done the unboxing and first impressions uh, video that's over on exclusively on evblog.com. Catch you next time. Thank <laughs> you.